Hi, and welcome to the Working Differently in Extension podcast. I'm Bob Birch. Great to have you along for today's program. Our guest today is Katie Stouffer. Katie is a research assistant professor at the University of Florida. She's in the Agriculture Education and Communication Department, and she's also an e-extension fellow who has been looking into citizen science and extension for about the past year. And uh, we're going to talk to her about that experience and sort of where citizen science and extension are right now. Welcome to the podcast, Katie. Hi, thanks. Glad to be here. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you would define citizen science? I think we have sort of a, a general idea of, you know, two words that we understand mashed together, citizen and science. But is, it, is there sort of a, a more formal definition of what, what makes citizen science? Yeah, so I think there's a lot of definitions that are the field is trying to work out. Um, and there are some groups that have more formal definitions. But I, I think I like to think of it as people who are not necessarily professionally paid to do science that are participating in the research process in a whole bunch of different ways, which, which makes it incredibly hard to actually define, for one thing. But yeah, it's, it's people often outside of academia, but you know, some people would say even academic scientists who get paid can be citizen scientists on another project. Uh, but yeah, so just people every day getting involved in research. So uh, the example that I guess always comes to my mind, and you know, I was sort of exposed to the term, you know, probably like a lot of people were in the last, I don't know, handful of years, you know, five or six years, um, is the Cornell Ornithology Lab's bird count. Is that yep. sort of, is that, you know, what we think of when we think of citizen science people out in the field making their own observations and reporting back? Yeah, and I think that hints at the history of how a lot of these things got started, especially from academic projects that wanted assistance. So, you know, scientists in academia have been doing research for quite a while, but a lot of projects, especially things that are involving birds and other animals and, and really any global topic, a single researcher and a single research lab of five or 10 people can't physically go out and be collecting data over even over like a long period of time in a sustained way or over a huge geographic area. Um, so they thought to turn to other people to say, hey, if you're out in the field, would you, you know, take a picture of this or note that and send that data to us and then we can compile that all together in one big data set and do analysis on it. And so that's one way things have come from sort of a top-down manner. Um, and, and so that's, I think, a real traditional way to think about it. But what's exciting is that that's really expanded um, over the years to be people involved in a lot of different ways, like I said, and in a lot of different types of projects. So you don't just have to collect data and send it to somebody else and then have them publish a paper and you might read that paper. Um, you could get involved in doing data analysis. So you could actually collect your own data and analyze it yourself and then maybe talk with other people on the project and say, well, here's what I found in Gainesville. What are you finding in, you know, your part of North Dakota that has to do with this particular species of birds, for example. And then you might also then get a professional academic scientist or something involved and say, wow, we found these, you know, thousands of miles apart. This same bird is here, but it only appears in September in Gainesville, but it's in North Dakota in, you know, um, January. I don't know. I'm just making this up off the top of my head, right? <laughs> right. Um, so what does that mean? You know, you might, why, why are they going north for the winter? That seems weird, right? Um, other people might get involved in just, you know, asking questions and turning to um, academic partners from the community. Like the community comes up with a question and says, well, what's going on with this? I think I see some weird stuff happening. Can you help me design something to really figure out what's going on? Mm -hmm. so. so, how did you get interested in this, and why did you apply for your for the E Extension Fellowship to you know spend a year looking at it? Yeah, um, so it's something I've actually been interested in for a while. Before I did um, my PhD research in science education and, and got to the job I do now in in that kind of research. 
Uh, I actually worked in several science centers as an informal educator, and I think that's where I was first introduced to the idea of citizen science. And uh, so we, we kind of explored it for some of our museum programs, how we could get people engaged with science, which was sort of a broader goal of, of many of the science centers uh, that I worked for, you know, beyond just sort of, hey, let's share some information that we've got with you. How do we really get you involved in, again, the scientific endeavor? Um, so that was one of the programs we explored and, and I tried to do in a couple of different ways uh, with some summer camp groups and some other programs. Um, and then I just sort of, it, it happened that, you know, during my PhD, I didn't get to explore it much more. Uh, but when the e-extension fellowship came up, I was like, you know, the research I do now is continuing to try and find ways to get people involved and engaged. And now that I'm in a cooperative extension institution, it just made a lot of sense for me to say, oh, wow, I could do some research on this and get to know extension on what they're doing on this kind of at the same time and get back into the field after having been away for five or six years or so. Um, I had come across the Citizen Science Association, you know, just again in kind of paying attention to the stuff in the field. Uh, but this was, it was just kind of perfect timing for me. And, um, you know, the, the money to sit and, and kind of think about this was also, of course, really enticing to, to take that time to, to dedicate to a project like this. So, um, you know, my understanding of the fellowships and sort of what I know about them from the, from the RFPs and talking, interviewing some other folks who, who have done them, um, is that there is a quite a bit of freedom here, right? You have some deliverables, but you, you know, no, the extension is not telling you how to go about this. Was that a good thing or a bad thing? You know, in the beginning I was like, what are they going to, what, what am I going to have to report at the end and where am I going to go with this? But it, it definitely turned out to be a good thing. I mean, they framed it to me basically as what we call a developmental evaluation that you don't have, that you sort of start with a plan in mind, but you definitely have the flexibility to kind of follow it where it goes. And, you know, I guess I went in with some ideas about what was happening sort of in the rest of the citizen science field outside of extension and e-extension. And, you know, just catching up again after, like I said, even five years was really interesting to see what was actually happening and to actually then take some of my ideas and talk to other extension folks um, and agents and say, you know, how would you really use something like this? Or how are you using it? It, it really did, you know, shape and change what I, what I thought I was doing in the beginning. I thought I was going to do focus groups and, and be like, okay, that, that's it. But really I started doing some sort of individual interviews with different players and just realized that things were just so broad and so all over the place. There were a lot of opportunities, but a lot of like, wow, where do I, where do I even suggest someone starts? Um, but I also found a lot of people in extension were either, you know, there were people that were super involved to people that were, you know, kind of involved to people that were thinking about getting involved and some people that still had no idea what it was. So it was fascinating to see just the range all across. Um, but that definitely shaped where I went. And, you know, at the end, I had deliverables that I think looked similar to what I had thought, but maybe the way I went about producing them um, wasn't the way I had originally thought I was going to do it. So, right. yeah. So what about some of the, uh, what you heard back, what, what were some of the projects that involve citizen science that you heard, heard back about as you, you know, went through your investigation? Oh man, there, there are so many different projects. It's really, really hard to even think where to begin. So there's, there's things that are like just getting started. So one of the other e-extension projects that was funded um, was called, called Plant Shoe. And it was, if I'm remembering this right, and you could probably help me out because you probably talked to them too, but um, it was trying to find sites for people to plant um, plants that would be like alternative medicine, like herbs and stuff like that. Um, but using again, data from people like in the local area. And I want to say they were kind of starting with like some area in the Appalachians, but um, 
having the people there go out and get data on what that, that ultimately could be figured out with what would be a good site. And then these people that were gathering data would presumably be the ones that would go out and plant this new potential crop, um, whatever herb or, or alternative sort of medicine sort of thing that, that they were interested in. And I, I want to say there were a couple that, that the project had, had going. Um, there's also a ton of things with um, everything from Project Bud Burst, which is watching when trees and plants um, have their leaves come forth and their buds and their flowers. So that issue of watching the timing of plant, they call it phenology, I think is the scientific word. Um, just that when, when plants do things, so you can follow uh, when you might have an allergy attack, for example, because, oh, here comes the pollen, right? Or even just tracking that stuff over time and space again to help figure out where those species are going with climate change. Um, and then there's things that are um, a longstanding extension project uh, or set of projects is a whole bunch of things related to water monitoring and water quality and quantity. And that's been especially strong in the Northeastern United States, um, but has spawned a lot of projects and a lot of versions. Florida Lake Watch is another one that's a, a state kind of volunteer water monitoring that I'm sure has connections to those uh, New England groups. And, and you know, it's, it's just really, it was really fascinating to see how Extension was involved in terms of, did they create the projects? Did they just get involved in the projects? Were they partners with other community organizations? So you really, again, saw the whole gamut of how Extension is involved in communities from, you know, building partnerships to being a partner that's brought in for expertise to, you know, taking a 4-H group and having groups or having activities for the students and, and, and folks to do. So it, it's just, it was, it was fascinating to see. So You mentioned in a blog post that you did uh, on the e-extension site that that sort of wide variety of, of ways that extension is involved, um, you know, can be a strength and a weakness. What, do you, what did you mean by that? Yeah, absolutely. Well, so the strength is obviously that you can get involved in almost any way that, that I can think of. Um, the weakness is it was, it's really hard for someone like me to put together a real coherent set of here's where we need to go and here's where we can go next. So I, one of the things I struggled with is I had wanted to do a sort of survey of really everybody in extension, which, you know, looking back on it, you're like, wow, that would, how, how much of a pain would that have been? But, but to really understand, like, I, I, the unfortunate thing was I didn't get a real sense of how many people were at kind of each level. Like, how many people are like, you know, Chris Stepanuk at, uh, I think she's at University of Vermont now, who's working with this water quality network and is, like, leading this thing that's been really involved for many, many years. Um, so probably not many of her, right? But, but how many people then are at the, you know, I'm in 4-H with volunteer leaders that want to get involved, you know, versus how many are, I'm partnered with a community and we want to start our own project. So I didn't, I, I, I felt like at the end I had to say, well, here's a little bit for everybody and I hope that's a starting point. But, you know, even the, even the um, email group that we've got through eExtension I think it's it's kind of the same thing. People are just at so many different levels. It was it was hard even to get people to be like, okay, there's two people that want to start their own project. So if you two are collaborating and sharing ideas, you know, uh, but and then there's three people that are 4-H that want to get their groups involved. So how do they figure out which projects are appropriate? That sort of thing. Um, so it was. You know, but but like I said, there's otherwise there's a ton of ways just to get involved. So, how, how do you see citizen science um, relating to the mission of extension? Um, yeah. Do you, Do ahead. you want to tell us yeah. what you know the real mission? <laughs> oh, that's a good <laughs> question. <laughs> what's the good? What's the real mission? I mean, um, you know, I guess I could. I, as I think about it, I could see it in a, in a couple of different ways. But if if ex, if we take the extension mission as you know, improve people's lives and communities, uh -huh. you know, through Absolutely. the diffusion of research based 
information or something. You know, we, I mean, we could all, I'm sure we could quibble. It sure. might be a great podcast to get a bunch of people on. We'll just fight about what the <laughs> edge of mission is. Um, but, but that general idea that we are an educational institution, that we are, you know, in some ways a change agent. So how do you see it? Do you see, how do you see science, citizen science fitting in? What parts of that does it speak to, I guess? Yeah, I think it's I think it's fundamental and can operate to support that mission absolutely. Um, what I think is is awesome about citizen science is, you know, people that do science professionally had good experiences in school enough to persist and get jobs in it, right? And presumably to like it enough to stay. I get the impression, and again, this is hard to do research on, but it's sort of you know, the people who don't do science professionally. You know, they're the ones who, as children, were fascinated by the world, and as I think we all are, and, you know, have this innate curiosity that we all seem to have, and I think they run into school roadblocks, and I don't want to turn this into, like, bashing schools by any means, but the way we teach science in school is often very different than the way it's practiced in the real world, and citizen science is an opportunity to get involved in all the different levels and all the messiness of science in, in, in reality. And I think it provides really great local concrete context for a lot of that too. And so, um, you know, sort of as an education tool in general, it can give people a real better understanding. We think, and this is where some of the research that again, the Citizen Science Association and others are, are doing is, you know, we think that it can give people a real good sense of, the limits of science and you know what science can tell us um, and even where we need to go next um, but also then for very specific issues very specific community issues for example it can actually help create you know a, a, a picture of the problem and then with understanding of the problem you know put in place solutions and maybe even test those solutions and iterate those solutions if need be. So it's, I think it's, it's a, an incredibly powerful tool um, that, you know, once people really engage their audiences with it and, and, and um, wrap their heads around how to use it. And, and I'm not going to lie, it can take a while to think of that as more than just, Hey, I'm going to go out and collect data for someone um, or even to have the courage to be like, hey, I'm going to call up my friend or maybe not even a friend, somebody down the road at the University of Florida and have them ask, you know, help me with this insect problem that I've got, you know? Um, so I, I think that's sort of like the opportunity and the strength for, for getting this again, you know, down the road is there's a lot of ways and, and a lot of power to it, but it's, it's kind of daunting to get into it perhaps still, so... Yeah, and you know, I think you might have spoke to this in the blog post as, you know, extension being that conduit between the research and the universities and the citizens. So it seems like maybe it's a it's a at least a role that fits um, where we sit in the relationship between the public and the university. I think so. I think part of the problem is still, as a lot of us in extension say, extension is still the best kept secret, right? So. It's those people that, that don't really maybe know that an extension exists um, and don't know that we could be a go-between between some of these academics if we wanted them to be involved. Or, you know, even just um, some of the institutions for research um, in terms of, like, publishing your results or getting access to something you might need maybe even knowing what instrument you need. Um, you know, some of those things are still unfortunately controlled in a lot of ways by academia or institutions of some sort. And, and if, if you don't know that extension could be sort of that go between, you know, that's, that's going to make it harder for community groups to really, you know, take that, that step, like I said, and, and be able to solve some of their problems themselves um, or in collaboration. Right. So. Well, what do you, what's your sense of the general, uh, feeling of academia of researchers about citizen science oh that's an interesting question so without having done 
even any sort of interviews like I got to do with this fellowship because it all focused on, um, you know, I guess people in extension, which did include some faculty, but uh, the faculty I talked to were obviously, you know, citizen science proponents. Um, that's a, so, okay, let me back up. I, again, I don't want to get in too much trouble here, but my sense is public engagement and that sort of effort, what, what we've called, you know, variously outreach over the years and science communication, whatever, whatever, is still not a top priority of many researchers. And to the extent that citizen science kind of falls in that, other than them just actually going out and having someone bring them or, or submit their data, I think it's still going to be a lower priority for people. And that's partly because of the way we get rewarded for our jobs, which right now is still, a lot of us is primarily research output to other researchers and maybe a little bit on our teaching to our students at the university. Mm -hmm. And then there's like, oh, you might ha can do some public outreach, but it either falls into this messy area of service or we don't even know how to put it on your performance, you know, review for your uh, promotion and that sort of thing. So I don't know what their true feelings are, but without those institutional structures, it's often hard for them to participate. Now, there's also the people, I think, that get citizen science data and are frustrated at the quality or with the quality of it. So actually, there's some, some discussion in the literature like, oh, is this good data or not? And well, you know what? You might, wouldn't have any data at all uh, if you didn't have this data. But at the same time, you're right. You know, it may not be useful for some of the questions you might want to answer. And so what can you do about it? And again, then back to those academics that don't have a lot of preparation to do community outreach and engagement. Um, it can be frustrating for them because they're like, okay, well, I want better quality data, but how do I, how do I even tell people or figure out what the problem is? Like, is it that they don't have the right equipment? Is it that they really don't want to go out and collect data on this tree every day? Is it that, like, how can we get them even to have a conversation is still, I think, a barrier. So, but, but the good news is that's changing uh, around communication in general, I think, over, over the last few years, uh, last 10 years, let's say, that I've been kind of doing this, um, it's, it's definitely getting better. Um, and I think it's, it's going to move that way. But yeah, we have some, we still have barriers and significant ones. Yeah, it seems, you know, maybe this is just a broader uh, cultural, societal trend is that, um, this idea of engagement of the public is an issue for everybody from marketers to corporations to cooperative extension and researchers. And, and is that a large view of citizen science is like separated from the data. Yeah. The data is great. This helps me, but actually engaging the public to build some kind of trust in, you know, research based information in the future um, is important. Yeah, I think that's true for some people, yes. Um, I, I mean, you're always going to have a spectrum. But yeah, for a lot of people that are involved in the education side of citizen science, absolutely. Um, there's still going to be some scientists that just, you know, want the data and that's great. And, you know, we can find ways to partner with them and still, you know, make those experiences rich, I think, for all sorts of participants. But yeah, I, I think you're right. It is, you know, and especially as we go towards things like moving away from just this idea of like, we need to give people knowledge, 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 and then they'll make good decisions to let's help them, you know, make what can be difficult choices or trade-offs, but really support them in changing behaviors that make use of this knowledge that we've got and behaviors that will make a difference in the way that we think will improve lives as we want to do an extension. Um, so I think that's, yeah, that's definitely a broader goal for some people. It, it, and it's funny, again, even in the Citizen Science Association, which is this group that has kind of finally formed around all of these separate grassroots kind of projects, uh, but to try and help 
everyone take advantage of, the, of this momentum. Uh, but there, there's definitely some people in there that are interested in these bigger engagement and education goals. And some people that are just like, how do we get better data and, and that sort of thing. So um, the good news is, like I said, there's room for a lot of different ways to be there. Maybe I'm sounding like a broken record. <laughs> anybody still knows what that is so yeah <laughs> your my mp3s don't don't skip yeah. like the records used to right. um so one of the things that you proposed or you know thrown out there is this idea of a master citizen science volunteer program along the lines of like a master gardener program mm -hmm. tell us a little bit more about how you would see that sort of taking shape yeah, so that was one of my ideas that we sort of hit on, again, in, in kind of talking with a couple other groups. A couple of things that people have been throwing around are the idea of really formalizing what people do learn from these in the, in, in the way of like making a portfolio, for example, for a high school student that could say, hey, college that I'm applying to, here's what I did in citizen science, or here's what I learned, like I earned my badge in data analysis or whatever. Um, so th that idea of certification kind of, at the same time, we thought about volunteer certification that would be the people that would help make, you know, those real changes happen. And, and when we think about developing volunteers that can then go do the work of extension or science or whatever they are, you know, we, we think about making sure they've, gotten to a level of expertise and comfort with, you know, going out and sharing it with others. So I thought, well, we've got master gardeners and master naturalists, and that's sort of the thing that we're asking them to do to try and um, expand the reach and, and um, utility of extension, right? So, so if we're really thinking of extension as a go-between on these, between public and academics, um, you know, wouldn't that be something like a master citizen scientist who is the person that the community member knows they can go to and say, hey, look, we've got this problem we think, we want to start, you know, a project on it. Who would you think at the university could help us? Or do we need somebody from the university? Or where do we go to find a project like this that's already existing that we can get, you know, grab those tools and use? And at the same time, it would be the academics could come and say, hey, you know, I've got this national, international, regional, whatever scale project, and I'm looking for some people to help me collect data in a meaningful way for me so I know that the quality is good, but also for um, them to have a meaningful experience and maybe earn these skills and certifications that they can turn around. Um, or even if it's not a certification, they can just, you know, have a meaningful experience instead of just collecting data and sending it off and never hearing about it. Um, so the scientists could be like, well, so what kinds of groups would the master citizen scientist in extension think to reach out to in the community? Who could we get involved? Who would this make a difference for? Um, rather than each time somebody creates a citizen science project in academia or has a project that wants to collect data, them having to reach out to a boys and girls club or a 4-H group or a, you know, whatever, a, a church group, you know, that master citizen scientist maybe is the one that knows the community level and say, oh, these people are really good at that and they've been looking for this. It's kind of like a, ma like a matching program almost. Um, the other thing I think about is, is like university foundations matching donors with projects that need funding, right? Like, Donors that want to donate to athletics, they steal the, steer them to the athletics. And donors that want to donate to a building, you know. I, but, but I think that would be kind of the same way, that the, the master gardeners, um, you know, do some, some actual workshops themselves. The master citizen scientists could do the workshops that offer um, training on how to do the data collection protocol, or um, they would facilitate getting people together for a meeting to talk about data analysis or to write the papers or I don't, I mean, I don't even know. It could look very different for very different people. And I guess that's the thing is this master citizen scientist wouldn't be tied to any particular project. They would just be sort of a champion of citizen science in general. And if they needed outside expertise, they 
would know where to get it. If they needed participants, they would know. And they're kind of that go-between um, connector person. Um, that, that was my thought. And, you know, I took that to some extension agents and they, they pointed out some ways that that was a good model and some, some things with the way extensions working now that it would make it a tougher, um, tougher way to actually do what we think we would want. Um, but that's exactly what, you know, sort of I got out of this is, is some ideas and I can continue talking with partners and, and looking for ways to make something like this happen and strengthen the citizen science and extension communities. So for the listener and the extension professional uh, who, who might be hearing this, um, what would you recommend in terms of, well, this sounds intriguing. I want to get people engaged or there might be, um, is there places where they could go to find out more information or are there steps that they could take to sort of get going with citizen science in their university or in their, in their community? Yeah. So, so what I ultimately ended up with from my, my project that I think is, is a good place for people that are not yet engaged and, and like you say, looking for more, is um, actually the webinar that I did that was like how to get started, which lists a whole bunch of resources and, and goes into a little more depth in terms of, um, again, different ways you could get involved so that you could think about which one and then follow those resources. Um, in general, I would say if you're in extension, and even if you're not, the e-extension uh, communities of practice, the, the email group that I was talking about earlier, um, is open to people to participate in. And especially if you want to work with citizen science in an extension context, I would recommend joining that group and starting to meet people and, and share resources there. Um, we're kind of small, but we're, we're getting off the ground every once in a while. There's a little flurry of activity there. Um, and then the other group that is super comprehensive, but might be almost too much the other direction is the Citizen Science Association's email list, um, which is actually very active and has a whole bunch of people on there. Um, and it's something free to get on and, and just to kind of maybe listen to the conversations that are going on there. Um, so I would say those are your kind of starting points. Um, certainly people can contact me and have a conversation with me. I still have an extension appointment, even though my fellowship is technically over, uh, but as an extension expert, I'm always here for consultation. So if people want to talk to me, I'm happy to do that. Um, but, but yeah, I think the, the beauty of it is there's a lot of places to dive in now and kind of get your feet wet. And, and it, is, it can be kind of, kind of low stakes to get in and, and try something out for sure. Um, even if it seems intimidating at first, there's, you know, lots of ways to do it. So. Well, Katie, thanks so much for your work on this and uh, for joining us today on the podcast. You're welcome. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Katie Stouffer is a research assistant professor at the University of Florida in the Agricultural Education and Communication Department. Uh, she was the uh, wrapping up her fellowship in uh, as the E-Extension uh, Fellow. Uh, looking into citizen science and extension. All the resources that, that Katie mentioned, we're going to link those on the show notes page. You can find that at bobbirch.com. Remember to hit us up on Twitter. It's at WDNEXT, and all the podcasts are available at SoundCloud, soundcloud.com slash working differently. Thanks again for joining us. Have a great day.